So Jay, are you saying that Islam is based on a lie? You know, I've spent my career taking on some of the cultural baddies, you know, some of the most prominent intellectuals in the world, some of them in public debates, some of them behind the scenes. And I've come to realize that ideas define everything that we do. With an academic degree, you're trained to be a researcher and writer to the point that it's annoying. I mean, but I'm grateful for it. I'm not talking about books I've not read. I'm not talking about papers I've not read. Whether I agree with them or not actually isn't the point. Uh, there are quite a few books that I would read that I would say are actually evil books. Donald Trump, when he was in a divorce with his first wife, she said he has a copy of Mein Kampf next to his bed. I wish more people did. If the German people had bothered to read that book rather than just have it on their shelf, we might have avoided the Holocaust. If more people read the Quran, they'd be wiser to what Islam actually is, what they actually believe. If people bothered to read, as I have, the writings of Klaus Schwab and the various contributors to the World Economic Forum and the ideas that are driving the globalists, I read them because I want to understand their mentality. I cut out the middleman. I go straight to the ideology. Everything in your life is being defined by either your ideas or the ideas of the people around you. And each episode, we're going to be digging into a different idea that appears in the culture. This is Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton. Big thing converting to Islam. Yeah. For me, religion. I've always skeptic of it. There's so many get religions, so many gods, but the Muslim yep. community is the fastest growing community on the planet. Yeah. The Muslim community is, is so strong and if they've got your back, yep. they've got your back one million percent. A lot of people might have said to you, it's a power play because you are a chess man, everything moves. Yeah. What was the decision to join Islam? The closer you find yourself to God, the closer you find yourself to Islam. That's the bottom line of it. If you're gonna be atheistic like I was and then start to believe in God and then you're going to default to Christianity like I was because I was raised Christian. And then now I live in Romania, which is the second or third most Christian nation on earth. I think it's 98% Christian in the last census and it's Orthodox. Orthodox, I respect much more than Catholic because the Pope is an agent of the matrix. And Orthodoxy is still strong and strict and they still believe a lot of the rules and laws. But as you find yourself closer and closer to God, you find yourself closer to the idea of rigidness and the fact that there should be strict, clear, boundaries and guidelines god says yes and no god doesn't say well maybe if you want to it's okay on these days you shouldn't but no god says yes and no god is very clear and the closer you find yourself to god you start to want that as a christian i don't know how you answer to certain questions anymore yes as a true believer but which christians are true believers anymore as a Christian, I don't know what the correct answer is to a lot of the degeneracy that is happening in the world today. I don't know what a Christian would say. Would they say, it's fine, we forgive them for what they're chopping kids' dicks off? Or do they say, that's wrong? What does a Christian say? I don't know. I know what a Muslim says. So it's like, it's the only religion left that makes sense to me. And uh, you say it's a brotherhood and it has your back. I didn't consider that before I joined. I've learned it's true after I joined. Yeah, it absolutely is. There's like every organization or every group of people on earth, it's, it can go both ways. There's certain people who attack me for not doing everything completely correct like I'm supposed to, even though I'm a Muslim for seven months. They're like, oh, you didn't read this bar. Or so you do have those people. But in general, yeah, it's a community. But I never considered that before I joined. I just found myself becoming more and more religious and finding myself speaking to God in my head more and more often and then being very disappointed with Christianity I see around me. How can I speak to God in my head and look for his guidance and then walk past a church and just covered in gay pride flags. It doesn't make it make sense to me. I, I just, I just found myself alienated from Christianity. It's like, well, which religion sticks to what it means? Which religion says what it means and means what it says? Cause that's the kind of person I am. And I want a religion that reflects my personality. And I want to believe that God also thinks the same way. So you end up drawn to Islam. Tell Andrew Tate that he is wrong in what he just said in that video, where do you start? Yeah, I, I, Andrew Tate is symptomatic of so many young converts in Britain that we have. 
who had uh, mimicked the exact same thing he has said. I get this all the time. Islam is the only religion that makes sense to me because it's black and white. He mentioned that. What you see is what you get. And God must be black and white because I feel much more comfortable in that type of environment. I want black and white. And it says something more about his personality as well, that he can look at a church that has LGBT flags and think that represents Christianity. Obviously, he's not really thinking it through. He's not really thought it through because he's probably reacting against what he sees here in the West because you're not going to see those kind of flags in Romania. They're here in the West. He's talking about United States, primarily United States. I don't see churches anywhere else, but maybe England. So it's obviously he's talking about Western Christianity. But what I would say, what, what I'm finding, when I, because we get a lot of, we call these, radi- these are radical Muslims who are radically changed because of the radical message. And the radical message is very seductive. And it's symptomatic, and that is, if you want to put God in a box to represent God that you like, that, that has no, uh, no amelioration, it's just straight black and white, then for heaven's sakes, go to Islam. Yes, absolutely. But if you're going to go to Islam, you can't just sit and pick and choose what part of Islam you want. You're also going to have to go to the Islam of the Quran. I remember debating uh, Benazir Bhutto. You remember she was the prime minister? I was at the Oxford Union. We were debating back and forth. And she had four people on her side. I had four on my side. We went at it for about two hours. And it was on, it was on this question, is Islam relevant for the 20th century? Uh, this is in the 20th century. Uh, and so she got up there and says, yes, Islam is relevant. Just look at me. I'm relevant. I walk like you. I talk like you. I eat like you. I, f- I went to Oxford University. I was president of the Oxford Union. When you can see my picture there up on the wall, beautiful picture of her when she was a student. I'm a Muslim, therefore I'm relevant. And I got up there and I looked at her and I said, you know, it's fascinating that you think you're relevant for the 20th century. I said, are you willing to eat, drink wine right now? I want you to get on, your, on, uh, on the news right now and to tell people in Pakistan you can now drink wine because I say you can drink wine because that's relevant. I want you to start eating pork. I want to see if you can start eating pork. Tell the whole people in Pakistan now they can start eating pork because that's relevant to living in the United, United Kingdom. I said, but that's not Islam. Islam is not based on what you want. Islam is not based on your needs or your desires or your likes and dislikes. Call that Bhutuism, but don't call it Islam. Islam is based on a book. And in the book is very clear, you do not drink wine and you do not eat pork. Something as simple as that. This is what defines Islam. So if you're going to take Islam, don't just take what Tate has showed you or what he's been told by all his henchmen there that is very black and white, but it's only his black and white. Well, did you pick up on the fact that he said, I want a religion that reflects my personality? My personality. My personality. Me. That's actually a stunning statement because of everything that he says in there, black and white, black and white, black and white. Uh, I mean, Islam means submission. You know, So here he is initially saying, I'm all about submission to the rules. I want the rules. I want it to be black and white. And then he slips in a very postmodern statement I want a religion that reflects my personality. I want a God who's created in my own image. It's important to have a Christian worldview. The question becomes, how do we build that? How do we develop that? Oftentimes we have Bible teachers who are very faithful in teaching scripture, but don't ever quite make the connection with the outside world. Other times we have Bible teachers who don't really want to touch certain topics because they're just seen to be too toxic. At tomap.com, you are going to find a wide range of issues being addressed to help you build out that Christian worldview. They're on things from from suffering, uh, dealing with mental health, to racial reconciliation. These are all issues that you will find at tomap.com, and they'll help you to build out a Christian worldview and to flourish. I hope you learn a lot from the podcast, but you can go beyond the podcast to the courses that we offer at Tome. So I hope you'll take a look at them and sign up. To get access to more than 100 Tome courses, use the code IDEAS. And for $8.25 a month, you can get access to all kinds of courses on a wide variety of subjects. Individuals with expertise, with experience in subjects 
that will be meaningful to you. So use the code IDEAS and for $8.25 a month, you can get access to all of them. Go to tomap.com. Back to the podcast. Have yeah, you heard he lately that. what's been happening to him? Have you seen what people are now questioning him? Are you really suggesting, and, and they're starting to, what are they doing? They're opening up the Quran and they're going to set references like chapter 4, verse 34. Tate, is this is the religion that says you can beat your women? Are you really accepting that you can now beat your women? Uh, that you can have marital rape, chapter 2, verse 223? Uh, that the halal of marriages in chapter 2, verse 230, that stipulates that a man can divorce his wife, not the other way around, but after the third time, if, he, if uh, she, he wants to have her back the next day, she has to go to the imam, has to sleep, have penetrative sex with the imam, and then he has to sign a, a certificate of divorce before he can take her back. That's in chapter 2, verse 230. Is that the Islam you're talking about? Is that, does that represent you? He's being hung up now because people are starting to show the, to take the Quran to him and saying, this Quran, this Islam that you thought represented you, do you represent the Quran? And that's where you hang these people. And that's where you hang an awful lot of these radical Muslims. And I'd say that to anybody that gets excited about Islam, be careful about the Islam you're being preached to, you're being told to. Because the people who are giving the Islam that you love are really looking at your personality and basically saying, this, you get everything you want. Yeah, the very postmodern Islam. It's a very Islam. postmodern Islam. And then they, they, they slip them into the more radical you know, so, but it'd be the entry level Islam is a more postmodern kind of Islam, it's isn't just it? Just like the, what they, they do, these kids who are left off in those, they're in Nigeria. They bring them in the streets and then they have a, a, a cleric come and actually teach them the real Islam. And it's the real Islam that's the problem. The real Islam has to come from one book modeled by one man. Here's the book, The Man is Muhammad. That's the Islam that's not Tate. That's Muhammad. And that's why in every context, when you do, do a comparison and you look at the Bible and you look at the Quran, just do a like with like on almost in every category well, and the Bible that. wins. You're very effective at doing this, something you call the book and the man, the book and the man. Let's, let's talk <laughs> a little bit about that. The book of the man and the place. I've added one more category. Okay. Well, I'm not familiar with, with, with that part, but let's do that. Okay. The, the, there's the two books right here. And these are the ones that I use. I've been using these at Speaker's Corner. They're beat up. They've been, uh, they've been stolen from me numerous times. The police have, had, got, have got, had to bring them back to me later on, days later. So they've gone through a lot of wear and tear. That's why I've had to plasticine them. But if you look at this book right here, the Quran, it's about the size of our New Testament. When you open its pages... There's a number of things that stand out right away. First of all, it just does, makes no sense. It does, it, there's no flow to it. There is, this book has all, makes all kinds of sense. There is 25% of this book even the scholars don't understand. That would be anathema if you said that about the Bible. We can understand every bit of it. And one of the great things about it, it's not only understandable, the Bible, but you can preach it and then you can apply it to your daily life. That's the beautiful thing about the Bible. Not so the Quran. And that's why immediately you're talking about two, almost two different genres of literature. But when you start opening its pages and start reading it, and then start looking and seeing how applicable it is, let's just give the example, like I've given you an example of women. Chapter 4, verse 3, that says in the Quran that a man can have up to four wives. Already you see that there is an inequality in marriage. Chapter 4, verse 11, that stipulates that a a little, when a man dies, the boy gets twice the inheritance of the girl. There is inequality in so death. So it's misogynistic. That's, all of this is misogynistic. Chapter 4, verse 24. We're still in chapter 4. In verse 24, it says in this book that a, a, a man can have as many, uh, many women as his right hand possesses. These are women who are slaves of war. These are, uh, these are the concubines above and beyond the four wives that he's permitted in verse 3. And then it says that the man can give her her mahir. When, this is when, when he's traveling, that he can go into a mosque and he can go and buy a woman for three hours or 90 years, depending on how much he gives. And these are temporary marriages for, because he's away from his wife. That's in verse 24. Verse 34 that I talked about earlier, that a man is protector of his wife, but to those women who stand against their husband, he is to admonish her first. If that doesn't work, he's to throw her from the bed. If that doesn't work, he's to beat her. And the word is daraba in Arabic, which means to scourge, not lightly, like the English translation says. In chapter 2, verse 282, in court, a woman has half the testimony of a man. And then, as I said, two, verse two, chapter 2, verse 223, that a man may plow his wife sexually anytime he wants. That's called marital rape. 
And then we can end with chapter 2, verse 230, where you have a man can divorce his wife, but to have her back, she has to have penetrative sex, usually with an imam who has an anteroom where it's all done, and then he signs a certificate of divorce to have her back again. This is misogynistic to the core. Now, how can Andrew Tate support any of those verses? Do you see the difficulty he's going to have? He's never read the Quran. He wasn't told about this side of Islam. But see, when you become a Christian, the more you get to the Bible, the better it gets. Because it's usually, you're right, I admit, when you look at a lot of the churches, that's what gets me angry. I'm as angry as he is about what he's, what he's seeing. But it's the book that brings me back to Jesus Christ. It's not the church that I define myself by. It's the man behind the book, Jesus Christ. And I've said this so many times. In fact, Muslims always come up so to me. So we're talking about, pardon me, we're talking about the, these churches that are flying the rainbow flags and the kind of things that, are, that get him upset. We're really talking about churches that have gotten quite far away from the book. He's using an extreme to, to, to define the norm, and that's always wrong to do. If you're going to use an extreme on any position say that's the norm, not only have you got it wrong, but you're also misinterpreting it, and you're also being disingenuous to your hearers. So that's not a correct way to do that. So let's be careful. That's why it's important that I say if, you're going to, if we're going to use an extreme, let's at least use one that is supported by the book itself. A radical Muslim, people to me say, well, the radical Muslims only make up a very small percent. No, they don't. Uh, they, they, if you look at Pew International and what they have looked, what they have done with their Pew research, astonishing statistics. It's astonishing statistics. I don't have them on the top of my head right now, but it is the majority of Muslims around the world now are radicalized, and they've been radicalized not because of what they see in the news. They've been radicalized because they're reading the Quran for the first time. No, I've had Muslims tell me that they never wanted to read the Quran because they knew it was violent, there and you they go. Kn and they knew that there were things in it that they wouldn't like. They preferred to stay away from it, to still kind of be seen as sort of good Muslims, but without really being, you know, Muslim, because they, they didn't want to do the things that were in the book that they felt were, you know, actually quite immoral. Give me the, give me the elevator version of the Book of the Man. The Book of the Man. We're, we're, going, we're going 40 floors together on the elevator. I'm a Muslim. What are you going to say to me about the Book of the Man? Real quickly, the, the book itself is the, the text, and that's what Tate was talking about. I like this God. I like this God because he is so black and white. There are no grays there is what he was saying. And that's what the kind of God you're going to see in this book. He is very black and white. The problem is he is absolutely vicious. He is hugely, uh, hugely uh, uh, violent. In fact, I ask Muslims all the time, since 9-11, when everything has moved to the religion of peace, I ask them very quickly, show me one verse in this book that says you're to have peace with me. One verse. And I've been asking this for 40 years. Show me one verse in the Quran. Oh, they, it just doesn't exist. Oh, they will try to go to chapter 2, verse 256, where there's no compulsion religion. I said, read the rest of the verse. Convert, pay a tax, or die. No, not, that, not this one. The, the rest of the verse in chapter 2, verse 256, is if you do not stand, if he stands against um, uh, the Allah and his prophet, great shall be his perdition, for he shall be in hellfire. That's in 256. They re need to read the whole verse. There's all kinds of comp compulsion in that. They usually then go to chapter 2, verse 190 or 290, sorry, uh, which says, if you are attacked, defend yourself, but don't go beyond the limits. See, that's peaceful. I said, have you read the next verse? And slay them wherever ye find them. Well, what? I'm not, I'm dead. There's not much, there's no limits that you haven't gone by. I'm no longer alive. And it's usually what the, their favorite verse is the one that Obama used to always use. And that is chapter 5, verse 30, uh, 32, which says, O children of Israel, he who takes the blood of one is if he takes the blood of all, but he who saves the blood of one is if he saves the blood of all. Well, that's a beautiful verse on the redemption analysis on whom? On the blood of Abel, because that's the verse that precedes it. Here's the problem with that verse. Who's it to? O children of Israel. So it's not to Muslims. It's to the children of Israel. So what? why are they using that verse? They need to use the next verse that follows it, verse 33 which says, those who stand against Allah and his prophet and cause mischief in the land, crucify them and cut off their hands and feet from opposite ends. That's the verse they should be using, the very next verse. So in every case, whenever they're trying to find anything peaceful in this book, you need to read the context. You need to read the next verse that follows it to show the context of that verse. There's no peace whatsoever here. I'm still waiting after 40 years for Muslims to show me one peaceful verse. That's the first problem here. Take a look at this book. Put away your sword, Peter, for he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. Ooh, I love that right there in Matthew 26. Or in Matthew 5, when Jesus says, for I've not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. Verse 19. What does he mean by that? Well, he explains it. Six different applications right after in Matthew 5. 
he, and I'll just, I won't go through all of them, but here's two I'll just give you real quickly. For you have heard it say, that's the Old Testament, all that's the Mosaic law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I now say, turn the other cheek. That's a whole new application. Verse 43, you have heard it say, that's the Mosaic law, that's the Old law, that's the Old covenant, that's the Old Testament, to love your friends and hate your enemies, but I now say, love your enemies. Ooh, two, 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 two. Verse 44. Show me a verse like that in the Quran. There's no verse like that in the Quran. And there's just verse after verse after verse in Christ's ministry of peace. Where did he ever kill anybody or bring anybody to uh, sh uh, shut them down with violence? Not once. Muhammad, take a look and just look at chapter 9 of this book, the, which is the last chapter that was revealed to Muhammad according to the exegetes. It is verse after verse after verse of violence. Slay the unbeliever wherever ye find them. Besiege them. Lay in wait for them with every kind of ambush. That's verse 5. Make war on the people of the book. That's you and me. Until we pay the jizya. That's what you were referring to earlier. That's the zakat. Until we pay the, the, the tax. The, that's in verse 29. So you can look at the Quran, and it has so many of these verses. Chapter 47, verse 4, which is chapter 47 is an interesting one because the very first three verses define who a believer is and who an unbeliever is. And then verse 4 says, cut off the heads of the unbeliever. Not for anything we've done, just cut off our heads. And then verse 5 and 6 says, he who participates in jihad, great shall be his reward in heaven. That's the only verse in the Quran that stipulates if you die while you are in the cause of Allah, you're going straight to heaven, which means... Can you understand then why this is such an attraction to young men, Muslim men and women? There's no way that you can get to heaven except by working off your salvation. But no one knows whether they're going to get there unless, according to verse chapter 47, verse 6, unless they die in the cause of Allah. No wonder it's such a magnet then. No, for people it makes, to do that. listen, if you're a, if you're a Muslim, um, it is a rational act to kill yourself or to offer yourself to die, perhaps as a suicide bomber, a, a, you know, a terrorist for the faith. From, from our point of view, you would hear people after 9-11 say, you know, whoever flew those planes in those buildings were crazy. Given their worldview, it's not a crazy act. It is a rational act in so, it, to the degree that it's based upon that book because they believe that their God is telling them to do this and they believe there's reward in the hereafter and that they can secure their salvation and even the salvation of their loved ones. And that's chapter 8, verse 16. Yes. Remember when they were asked about 9-11, uh, when Yusuf Karadawi was asked this right there at Heathrow Airport, he asked, what about these planes being flown into buildings? Is this subjective? Is this permissible? He just opened right up to chapter 8, verse 60, which says, and make ready against them all you can of power, including steeds of war, to threaten thereby the enemy of Allah. Steeds of war... Anything that is used for war, including planes. You can weaponize it. It's right there in the Quran. So though yep. this wasn't talking about airplanes, it means any vehicle. So he said you can use tanks, you can use any means, you can use guns, swords, anything else to threaten them. This is called, this is called terrorism. That's what you do with terror. To terrorize them is the other way to, to, uh, to translate that verse. So he was just quoting straight out of the Quran, being able to support him. That's why you need to read the Quran. You need to see this is such a textbook for what's happening around the world. ISIS, remember, in the Dubik magazine that they used to do, whenever they did an atrocity, they put out the next week this beautiful glossy, uh, and you can see pictures of it, uh, the Dubik magazine, made by, almost all of those were made by people in London. These were Muslims living in London who were doing it for them. Glossy, beautiful uh, production. And they would always show the atrocity, and then they'd give a scripture verse to support it showing that everything they're doing followed the Quran. You know, very interestingly, Jay, some, uh, some years ago, not, not, that, not that long ago, but I went to, I think, 13 sites of uh, Islamic you know, terrorist acts, you know, where there are these places from Westminster Bridge to, I've been there many times, the, uh, the Bataclan in, uh, in Paris, the Hypermarché in Paris, the, the uh, uh, Charlie Hebdo offices, there and I'm just ask people who are, you know in the neighborhood you know uh, tell me a little bit about this you know what happened here and of course already knowing something of what what happened here and the answers were were all more or less the same uh, people would say you know these are some kind of religious radicals or something like that but one of the most interesting ones was in Stockholm you know you will will remember the Russian uh, immigrant who was a convert to Islam actually I'm not sure I mean he may have even been Georgian you know or uh, but he had stolen a beer truck, 
and taking that beer truck straight down a right. pedestrian mm-hmm. shopping district where mothers are, very fashionable boulevard, where mothers were you know, out shopping with their kids and plowing over those people, their children, and until his, his uh, truck you know, ended up embedded in the side of an, of an Allen's department store. And I was there you know, maybe a month after that attack. And I went from one shop owner to the next. I mean, right where all this stuff happened, asking them, hey, you know, I'm, I'm here writing a piece on the terrorist act that, uh, that occurred here. People get quite nervous when you start asking them about this. But some of the most interesting conversations that I had were when I would ask the question, what do you think motivated this? And the people would respond by saying they're crazy. They're crazy. This guy was crazy. He's completely crazy. And then I would follow up with this question. Do you think his religion had anything to do with it? And knowing the PC answer to that, they would all say, no, no, no. I don't think, no, Islam is a religion of peace. And I would find myself saying, you were right here and you saw right out your window. I mean, the window would be right there, their storefront. A child plowed over by a truck right there. And you're still prepared to defend that religion and say that that man's religion had nothing whatsoever to do with what he did. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I, I don't think it had anything. I just think he was crazy. Yeah. It's, it's astonishing, the ignorance in the West, but the, also the willful blindness to what the religion really is when that book is taken very seriously. Our point here, my point here, isn't that every Muslim is a terrorist or a would-be terrorist. The ones who take that book seriously, that's a very different, that's a very different category of Muslim. And I think what you're finding, and by asking these questions, is the people you're asking are all Westerners who've been brought up in a Judeo-Christian environment. And a Judeo-Christian environment starts A highly the secularized environment. Nonetheless, there's yes. still a memory there. Yes. And the, certainly the morality is still very Judeo-Christian in the context that we want peace. And, and tolerance. We are tolerant. Tolerance of, uh, of everything. But you notice that that, where do, where do you think that peace comes from? It doesn't come from this book. It's based on this book. But only vaguely. Nonetheless, 2,000 years. very, very vaguely, because it's not actually a Christian kind of piece or a Christian tolerance, but I do, do agree Let me make my that there's point. Let me make a my certain point, measure of muscle memory there. I'm not going to argue with this okay, on this. Okay, continue. I still, I, I'm finding this enormously different, because whenever I go to Muslims and I ask this question about peace and tolerance, they start, actually, they don't know where it comes from. They just assume, because they come to the West, they love what they see here in the West, that there is much more of peace environment. I said, why is it you've left your country? And what is it about Pakistan or India or Bangladesh that you've left that you don't want to go back to? And it's always the violence. And I said, where do you think that violence comes from that's embedded so deeply in your culture? And I said, could it do with this book? Have you looked at this book? And they don't want to answer that you question. Know, you know, it's so and funny. Let me finish. What's fascinating is the reason why they don't want to answer the question is because the, the majority of them have never read this book. The Muslims don't and read don't it. And don't want to. They don't. And don't want to. Because they're told that if they're going to read this book, they have to do it in Arabic. So they don't even know the content that's there. The only ones who have read this book are the radical Muslims who are usually the ones who are causing all the problems. They are the first ones to read the book and see how they're to act. And I'd say to this guy, Tate... That he, if he's now a real Muslim and he wants to do that black and white, he better go back to where the black and white comes from. He better go back right to the authority. Why don't he start reading this book? And then come to me in a week or two and say, and I can give him some verses to read. And then come back to me and see if he can support those verses. Because, see, what Muslims believe, and this is something that we don't believe in the West, we believe that this book is authoritative for us, but it's written by men. It's written in the two, uh, 2,000 years ago and earlier. Therefore, it's more relevant for that time, that place, those people but we contextualize it for the modern day because we know it's inspired by God, but we can take what Paul was saying in Ephesus or Philippi or Corinth and then apply it here to Dallas or wherever we are in the United States or around the world because the book, the book does allow us to do that. That's not how the Muslims read, read this book. This book is eternal, not written by men. This has always existed. Therefore, it's a litmus for all people in all places and all times, cannot be contextualized. It must be obeyed verbatim literalistically, this every is why, Muslim. This is why they produce cookie-cutter societies, same architecture, That's same, why, uh, same everything. Remember I said Whereas that Christianity, about when it enters into a culture, it transforms a culture, but at the same time, it, there's, there's a certain measure of that culture that remains that's not in conflict you know, with 
scripture itself. So the architecture might be different. Some of the some of the norms might be different. Some of the way the churches themselves function might be different. That's kind of the beauty of Christianity is it can transform a society and yet and and yet allow for a certain measure of uh, distinctiveness. Well, take a look at Paul's own ministry. What he said in Ephesus, he didn't say in Philippi. What he said in Philippi, he doesn't say in Corinth. He ameliorates it, he changes it, and really applies it depending on the city and the people and the needs that were there. I think the, probably the best example of that is look what we do with the Bible. What's the first thing we do? We translate it into the language of the people that, in, that are there so they can hear in their well, own language. Well, it's modeled by Jesus. He, he became man and he dwelt among us. I mean, he translated himself into our world, and that's, that's a model for us to translate Scripture into and, and I don't mean just the literal translation of it. I mean making it um, intelligible to people of, of of different backgrounds, ethnicities, and nationalities, languages. That is the beauty of the Bible. That's not the beauty of the Quran. No, look at the cover. What does it say on the cover? It says the interpretation of the meaning of the noble Quran. So this is not the Quran because it's in English. The only Quran is in Arabic. So yeah. that's why I always have a Quran that has Arabic and English next to each other, because that is the Quran. This is not. No Muslim will ever. Well, no Muslim will admit that the, that the Quran can be translated. It cannot be translated. It's the only the interpretation of the meaning. The only way you can read this book is in Arabic, which means Muslims cannot read it because 85% of all Muslims don't speak Arabic. So therefore, they don't go to the Quran to know how they're to walk, talk. Well, but it's e also a way of asserting a kind of. Um uh, authority, you you know, uh, we 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 alone have the inside information. You're excluded from it. So any objection you raise, I've experienced this many times with Muslims. Any objection you raise to the Quran, they will ask, "Well, do you speak Arabic?" Well, well, no. Well, your objections are not deemed to be valid. And uh, but it's, it also it's works within their own culture as well. It's meant this. to be utterly exclusionary. Yeah, and that's why when you go to almost any Muslim here in the United States or in Europe. They're mostly from the Indian subcontinent. Even the Arab speakers don't really have not read the Quran. And what's fascinating is when you open up these verses to them, they say, I've never seen that before. I didn't know that was there. And the, or they'll say, Jay, you put that in there yourself. So I always keep the Arabic next to it to show, no, this has nothing to do with me. I didn't, you know, I, why would I waste my time writing the Quran or trying to translate it? You've got it right here. It's, it, this is called Al Hilali and Khan the most authoritative one, the most popular one in the world today. And I said, just read the Arabic if you don't trust me. It's right there in the Arabic, and that stymies them because they can't read the Arabic. Okay. And that's why they don't know what the Quran is saying. And that's why most radical Muslims, whenever you ask them, uh, Muslim on the street, what these radical Muslims are doing, they're saying they're idiots. They're not real Muslims. And I say, hold on a minute. They're following the Quran, and you're not. So who is the real Muslim here? Okay, now I'm going to force you to do it. Uh, you, you don't seem like you want to do it, but I've seen you do it a thousand times at Speaker's Corner on the ladder. Book of the man, elevator speech. Give it to me quick. What do, you say to, what do you say to somebody? You're on the elevator. You don't have long. Explain to them the difference between Jesus and Muhammad, the Book of the Man. Real quickly, the Book of the Man for the, uh, these two books here, when you look at this book, this book has not only from beginning to the end, it follows a plan. You can see God's message all the way through. This book is all over the place. It doesn't have any plan whatsoever. It's obviously been borrowed from other sources. Even the sources that it's borrowed from, we know where they are now, and they are all been misrepresented. They've been bastardized, and I use that word purposely. I can give you example after example, chapter 23, chapter 70. Look at the bastardization that's gone on here. Perfectly good material coming out from people like St. Ephraim that were written in Syria, Syria Aramaic and then to completely destroyed in Arabic. So these are two completely different genres of literature. But then look at the God behind these two books. In this book here, this God comes our direction. This God comes and learns and walks and talks in the cool of the day. This God is there with Adam and Eve asking, where are you? He wants a relationship with Adam and Eve, a relationship that was broken. This God is incapable of coming to earth. He cannot. He never comes to earth. He can't do anything that we can do. He has no relationship with us. He has never been face to face with Moses or any other prophets. What, so obviously this God is a God, if he's incapable of coming to earth, he's a pretty small God. This God's a much bigger God. More than that, this God dies for us. What has this God done here? Even his name, Allah, is not a name. It's a title. It's the God. Where's his name? I'd like to know his name. This God gives us his name. Not only that, he not only gives us his name, he then uses it and takes it and appropriates it there in the temple. When they ask him, how do you know to Abraham, you're not even 50 years old, he says, before Abraham was, I am. He then uses his name, his personal name. What a difference between this and these two gods. This God 
tells the Muslims to die for him and then to kill for him over and over and over again. There's about 160 violent verses in this book. Show me one book in the New Testament that says we're to do anything of that sort. No, this book tells us to die for, not only for, uh, for ourselves, we're to die for our wives. We're to die for God, that we are not to kill anybody. And here's the beautiful thing. This book has God come and die for us. Show me what God has done here for us. Not a thing. So when you look at the book of the man, it's almost two completely different books, two completely different mans with two completely different messages. And that's why I always say, come back to the bigger, the better book. This is the one they need to come to. Because most Muslims, in fact, all Muslims already have a view of God. They've just got the wrong God. His name is Allah. Let's bring it back to Yahweh. The other thing is they also have a view of, of, of Jesus. His name is Issa. But look at the Jesus in this book, this Issa. He spends most of his time as a child doing miracles I've never seen before that make no sense, making birds out of clay and then blowing on them, and bending down a tree so his mother can eat. That's not in the Bible. These are not what Jesus did because they don't, they, there's nothing about them that has any, any value whatsoever. What's more is when he becomes an adult, he spends all his time in chapter 5, verse, uh, uh, verse 72, verse 75, denying his divinity, completely confusing the Trinity in verse 116. And then... When in chapter 4, verse 157, he refuses to get on the cross and let another man die in his place, which means we're all in perdition. If God did not die on the cross, we're all damned. Whereas this Jesus, this Jesus doesn't say much about his, his infanthood or his infancy. What it does tell us is what he did in the last three years of his ministry. And take a look and see what he did. He not only trained up 12 men to, know, to take out his message, a message of peace, of message of salvation, but then he dies on the cross. And look what he says on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That he did on Friday. That's the day that the Muslims celebrate. But Friday's here, but Sundays are coming. Look and see what he did on between Friday and Sunday. He destroyed death, destroyed what has separated us from that relationship with God, rose again on Sunday. And because of what he did on Sunday, I'm going to be with him walking and talking for eternity. What a God we have who comes and dies for us. This God does nothing, never is able to communicate with us, doesn't even enter time and space so we can know him or see him or have any relationship with him. I want a God who can come and die for me, a God who can relate to me, a God who can speak to me, a God who is right there alongside me. He's right here in this room as we speak. That's the kind of God I want, and that's the kind of God that Muslims need because they do know that there is a God that's taken from Allah, bring him back to Yahweh, that's taken from Issa, bring him back to Yeshua. That's the proper name for Jesus in Arabic. I don't know if you know that. And let's take him from the Quran. What a pervasive book. What a hopeless book. What a damning book. And bring him back to the New Testament, to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the whole Bible, really. Because everything I see is a beautiful God, a beautiful Savior, and a beautiful message. So the man, what Jesus. do you say? Muhammad fought battles, Jesus didn't. Muhammad did enormous amount of damage. Muhammad took people and killed them. Jesus raised, the, raised them to life. Muhammad took women and, and, and demonized them. Jesus ennobled them. Look at Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha, here is a, a rabbi letting a woman sit at, her, at his feet, a rabbi's feet. Even when Martha says, come into the kitchen, she says, no, you stay right there. It took a thousand years of tradition and turned it on its head. And remember the greatest event in the history of mankind, the resurrection. Who did Jesus show himself to? Mary. Not to the disciples. Mary Magdalene. Not to those who he had, you would think he would show himself to. He showed him to a woman first. And then the second time he showed himself was to a group of women on their way to Bethany. That's why I love what Jesus does. He ennobles those who the others who others tear down. Show me th anything that's of ennoblement here about a woman in this book. That's why in so many ways, in almost every category where people are looking for, when you come back to Jesus and what he does for not only women, for men, for families, look and see what he says to us as husbands. We're not to... Uh, er eradicate our women and to beat them and to subjugate them and to deny them, uh, even to rape them in marriage. There's nothing like that. What are we to do? We're to die for our wives in Ephesians uh, 3.28. That's our, is it, uh, 5.25. That's the beautiful thing that I love about the New Testament. We're to die for our wives. That's something that we do, that is found in no other faith, in no other book. And that's why the example of Jesus Christ, being a servant, is the example we need to see. Muhammad was nothing of a servant. He took 20% of everything that, was, that, that they, they raided, he took for himself. He told the men that they were only to have four wives, he had 12. He didn't even follow his own revelation. 
for those who criticize him, look at the 25 people. Look at uh, Asma bin Marwan. He comes from Mecca to Medina. He's not from Medina. He's there. He's been set up there to arbitrate between the Ansar and the, uh, the Jews. So he comes there as an arbitrator. Immediately he puts together the constitution of Medina where he becomes the arbiter between man and God. These Jews that are there, they don't like him because he's not from there. He's, they don't even know who he is. And suddenly he's an arbiter between man and God. So Asma bin Marwan writes some poetic verse against him. What does he do? He says, who's going to take care of this woman for me? One of his disciples goes that night and goes to her house. She has six children. She's suckling her child. He pierces her through the heart with his sword, comes back to Muhammad the next day, say, look what I've done for you. Muhammad turns towards him and said, great are you for what you have done for your prophet. He did that 25 times. He had people assassinated. And what was their crime? They used poetic verse against him. They just criticized him. Did Jesus do that? No. Thank God he took criticism. Thank God he was allowed, not only took criticism, he was allowed them to beat him. He allowed them to humiliate them. He allowed them to crucify him. And what does he say from the cross? Father, forgive them. Oh, what a contrast. What a model. What a man for today. What a man for every day. So I take it you don't believe that Christians and Muslims worship the same God? Absolutely not. <laughs> I'll tell you, this is what I, I do. I, I have to tell you this very quickly. I was talking to a woman recently who... She was, a, she was a Muslim convert to Christianity. And um, she said that she went and spoke to a Catholic priest while she was, you know, she was a Muslim and she was, she was planning on leaving that faith. And this priest told her that both religions worship the same God. Is that not, is that not astonishing? They say absolutely contradictory things <laughs> about God. And yet you still, have, you still have people, supposedly educated people, who say things of this nature. And for a priest or, or a pastor to say that is, is blasphemy. And Muslims say it all the time. And this is what I do. I, I shut this down in 10 seconds. When a Muslim says we share the same God, I shake their hands. I said, God bless you. Thank God you have finally admitted that Allah entered time and space and was walking and talking to the Kuru day with Adam and Eve. Thank God you finally admitted after 1,400 years. Is the Son of God. Let me finish. Thank God that after 1,400 years you finally admitted that God is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And thank God you have finally admitted <laughs> that God, your God, Allah, died on the cross and rose again and that he had a son. Now, I've said four things in just 10 seconds. You've noticed what I've said. <laughs> I've shut them down on God entering time and space. I've shut them down on saying that my God is God who is triune. Your God is not. My God died on the cross and rose again. You can't even begin to talk about that. And my God has a son. I want you to answer me in those four. By that time, they usually pull their hands out of mine and say, I've not said that. I said, well, they don't ever say we share the same God. Because those are the four cardinal areas that we disagree with Islam right there. We disagree. And what I've done also is I've opened up the gospel. Because now I can speak about each one of those four and show you that our God is a bigger God. Our God can enter time and space. Your God cannot. Our God is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. How do you think we have relationship? Where do you think we are social animals? Where do you think we got it from? Only a God who could be interrelational, eternally be interrelational within the Godhead. That a monad cannot do. Therefore, if you are interrelational, which you are, where do you think you get it from? Not from Allah, if he's just one. You have to come on home to our triune God. But our God also dies and rises again. Why can't your God do that? Proving that your God is not only omnipotent, he's no longer omnipotent, he's nearly, certainly not omnipresent, but he also is not, not, is not omniscient because my God knew he was going to do that even before he did it. He said so in John 10, prophesied he was going to do so. But then the sonship one is always the best one. I like to do that because they don't know what to do with sonship. They, I love that because that also models for me what we're to be as sons to our Father, of that relationship that is eternal between the Father and the Son, eternally exampling for us how we're to also do so in the family. So these four things is what you can shut that down just by asking that question and then introduce the gospel through them so that you then show and nail down exactly what kind of God we have. And it becomes very attractive to Muslims because they do want a God that they can talk to. They do want a God. They do five prayers a day, but God never responds to those prayers. Our God responds to our prayers. Their God is incapable of responding to their prayers because he's up in, way up in space, out in the, wherever paradise is. Can you then understand why this idea of a relational God who enters our time and space and actually walks and talks with us and wants to do so and continues to do so with the Holy Spirit, the Paracletus, that kind of God is enormously attractive to Muslims, but we need to get there and start saying it and start showing it and stop being bamboozled by them and acquiescing to them by saying we share the same God. What a, what a heinous thing to say. I want nothing to do with Allah. 
I want everything to do with Yahweh. You know, um, I think it's interesting how many Muslims I have encountered over the years who are like an Andrew Tate in that it seems very much like, I, I say they're like Methodists. I, I, I used to be a Methodist, so I can say this. I, I first started attending church at a, at a Methodist church, but, you know, the, the Methodists I knew were not, you know, Bible readers. You know, they, they create a God more or less in their own image. It was, you know, kind of my joke. And um, the, the Andrew Tate type of Muslims tend to be guys who are not really familiar with their own holy book and what it actually says. And um, to be able to take them to their own text and to show them what their own text says, what their own religion practices, mm. tends to be fairly jarring for them because they don't really want to go there. Has that been your experience? Yeah, I think I think, and this is what we started out with when we looked at Andrew Tate and we looked at that little video. Andrew Tate obviously didn't know what he's talking he, talking about. He doesn't know what religion he's actually adopted because he's he's only listened to the to his handlers, his handlers who are possibly more than likely, I would imagine almost all of them are Asian. These are Asian. They're brilliant at this. And almost all the converts we meet in Britain Bring are Bring them just along like, pretty slowly. Not only that, they actually said, yes, you, everything they ask for, they say, yes, this is, Islam allows that, gives you that. Yes, you can have, you, in fact, you can, you, can, you can do whatever you want really in Islam. It's, it's almost, a, they almost, they're giving them candy. And so, but there are rules and regulations that you must follow, and those rules and regulations are easy to follow, and they're the ones that they like to begin with, and that's why the Andrew Tate says, I like this God. He's in my image. He's the, exactly the one I want, I want to follow. It's only when they then, and what, what tends to happen, and this is what they found at Fuller Seminary when they did a survey on converts, and I did my master's degree on why Christians become Muslims. And what they found out is that Muslim, the converts only last about three years. The average convert to Islam only lasts about three years. And then they get disillusioned. What's the number one reason they get disillusioned? They start reading the Quran. Once you read the Quran and you realize that this is what supports everything, and you realize that many of the Muslims around you who have been offering all these things to you, and yet they're not reading the Quran themselves, they just are creating Islam in Christianity's image. I mean, this is fascinating how many Muslims I come up That's to me. That's an interesting way to put it. They are actually mimicking us. They're saying what we say. Yeah, God does answer your prayer. Since where does God answer prayer in the Quran? There's no answer. There's no give and take because God is a master. You're a slave. How can a master respond to a slave? They even call them slaves. Slaves. Abdullah, slave of God. One of the most common names. Abdul. Every time you see Abdul, that's slave of God. That doesn't exist in Islam. But the Western ameliorated state sanitized form of Islam that's being preached here in the United States and in Britain is very much an American, I'm sorry, an, a Christian Islam that is dovetail to what they're hearing in their school, what they're hearing on the radio, what they're seeing on television. And so I hear all these misrepresentations of Islam that really are seductive to the Andrew Tates of the world. And I say, okay, that's fine. I'm glad you like what we already, we're offering you. Why don't you come back to the source of everything we're offering you? Because you cannot find that source here. Come on back to the better book, the bigger book. Because you want to find a, really, a, a, a religion that gives you a relationship with God? That's what we've got you don't. You want to find a religion that says that really is a religion of peace, uh, that asks you to love your enemies? That's our religion. That's our faith. That's our book. Not here. So that's why in some ways for those kind of people, the Andrew Tates, we need to just take them back to their source, which is what you do. With the Marxists, you take them back to the source. Are you familiar with why they're saying this on television? Why they're doing this on our university campuses? Why they're trying to ameliorate everybody so that they will not, uh, so that there's only one side that is that is taught, and there is no, uh, there is no, there is no debate. They don't want debate. Where do, where do you think it all comes from? You bring them back to Marxism and shows them this is the this is the litmus of what Marxism, this is foundation of Marxism. I do the same thing with Islam. I take them back to their root. Just take them back to the root of the Bible, take them back to the root of the Quran, the book of the man, and you're pretty well going to be take them home because we need to bring them home. We need to bring them home to this book. We need to bring them home to this man. We need to bring them home to this God, Yahweh. Much bigger book, much bigger man, and a you, much bigger God. You've, you've spent a fair amount of time demolishing the historic Muhammad uh, in uh, the time we have remaining. My goodness. It's going to take about an hour. Well, you this don't have huge. an hour. You don't have an hour. It's a slightly longer elevator ride. But tell us, tell us a little bit about how you've been able to do that. What does that look like? 
Well, actually, before we do that, we, we demolish Mecca. The reason why, listen, there's three things, the book, the man, and the place. So which means you have a stool with three legs. One is Muhammad, one is the, the Quran, and one is Mecca. Those are the three things that props up Islam. You take out one of those legs and the other two fall. But the first one you need to take out is Mecca before you even get to Muhammad. Because there are many Muhammads. That's a very common name, just like there are many Larrys. And there are many Larrys living in the 21st century who probably are here in Dallas and all over the world. So which Larry are we talking about? Well, the Muhammad of this book, the Muhammad that's in the Quran, the Muhammad of Islam is not a Muhammad that lives in Mecca. That's the first thing. You can see that very clearly because this Muhammad and the name Muhammad really is not even a name, it's a title. It means the praised one. Many people use that name in the seventh century in Arabic. But there are Muhammads up there, but they're not down in the south. They're all up in the north. So we need to shut down Mecca first. And the way to do that very quickly is just ask one simple question. Show me one reference to Mecca prior to 741. Muhammad died in 632. We're talking about 100 years later. There is no reference to Mecca, the city, at all on any documentation. It's not on any map. Look at all of Ptolemy's maps from the second century. See if you can find Mecca on any of those maps. It doesn't exist. There is no reference to it in any annals. There's no reference to it in any documentation. There is no Qibla. There are no mosques facing Mecca until the 8th century. And obviously, the reason why is just take a look and see where Mecca is situated. It's in the middle of a desert. If you're in the desert, and it's always been a desert, there's no water. If there's no water, there's no food. There's no food, no people, no people, no place. That means no town, no town, no city. No cities, no civilization, no civilization, no history. That's why you've got to shut down Mecca. But see, you look at this book here, what it says about Mecca, well, it only says one reference. There's only one verse that refers to Mecca in this book, and that's in chapter 48, verse 24. Yet it says that, Abra uh, that Adam and Eve, when they were up in space in the Garden of Eden in chapter 7, when they were thrown down to earth, where were they thrown down to? Go to the traditions, and I'll tell you, they were thrown down to Mecca. So Mecca has to be the oldest city in the history of mankind, right? There's no one older than Adam and Eve. You need a city for people to live in. So obviously, if it's the oldest city in the history of mankind, someone somewhere should have known about it. In chapter 21, it says that Abraham rebuilds the Kaaba there in Mecca. Well, that means it should have been around in 1900 B.C. So everybody's asking, show us one reference to the city. You can't find it. Obviously, then, if there is a Muhammad, he didn't come from that city. So what Muhammad are we talking about? Well, to do understand that, you need to look at the coins. See, the first thing that people do whenever they come to power, and the caliphs are the same way, the first thing you would do back in those days in the 7th century, you didn't have radio, you didn't have television, you didn't have any internet. But what you do have is coins that everybody uses. That means that they will touch. So you put your name on the coin, you put your image on the coin, and then you put the, the religion that you belong to. Every leader did that, every caliph did that, every king did that. And that's the case all the way from the time of the Phoenicians when they invented coinage. So let's look at the coins. Look at the coins and you will notice that all the coins from the 7th century are either gold or copper or silver. They're all there, but where are the mints for all these coins? Well, they're all up in what is today Syria or over in what is today Ir Iran and Iraq. Nothing from down south. There's nothing from Mecca or Medina, where this is all, these Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, the first four caliphs were all ruling, including Muhammad. No coins up for any of them with any names from that part of the world. They're all from further north, but they're all in Arabic. They all are referring to themselves. They have their images on them. But take a look at what's on their images. They have crosses on all their images. Everyone's holding a cross or has a cross above their head. How can they be Muslims if they're wearing crosses? Look at Mu'awiyah, the greatest, the first caliph that's historical that we see living in Damascus. He starts the Umayyad Caliphate. You ask any Muslim, he was a good Muslim. Mu'awiyah, he ruled from 661 to 680. Look at his coins. He's wearing a cross. He's holding a cross. Look at the dam in Taif where he puts an inscription there that's all in Greek, and he is the leader of the believers. Well, what believers? Look at the top right-hand corner, and it's a cross there. He's a really, he is a, the, the leader of the Christians. There is no word called Muslim in anywhere. We can't find the reference to a people called Muslims in any documentation on any coins, on any rock inscriptions. And the great thing about coins and rock inscriptions, Larry, is that they don't disintegrate, they don't deteriorate, they're all written in Arabic. But look at the Arabic that they're using. They're using this Arabic. They're using the Arabic of the Quran, which has the Alif Maksura, which have the Tar Marbuta, which has the definite article. That Arabic is not spoken in Mecca Medina. The Arabic that would have been used in Mecca Medina is Sabaic Arabic, which comes from Sabaic area, which is what is today Yemen. 
That's the Arabic that has been used in Mecca Medina. That doesn't have the Tar Marbuta. That Arabic doesn't have the al Maqsura. That Arabic doesn't have the definite article. Yet this Quran is all using those uh, uh, word endings, which means the Arabic in this Quran comes from Nabataean Aramaic. It comes from Petra. It comes from Jordan, 600 miles further north. And that's where the coins come from, using the same Arabic. That's where the inscriptions come from, using the same Arabic. So where does this leave Muhammad in this whole geographic, you know, textual problem that you're laying out here? Well, this is actually, the great thing about this is the coins and the inscriptions, the rock inscriptions, are the two most damaging ones because they're the only piece of evidence that still exists from the 7th century that we can look at that is, that, that, that is lit, literary, literature that we can read. And that's why they're so dam damning for the Muslims, because the Muhammad that is there, there are references to Muhammad. We have Sabaeus referring to him. Uh, we have the Doctrine Iacobi that refers to a prophet. Uh, we have the, uh, I'm trying to think of the other one. I can't think of the top of my head. It'll come to me. Well, let me just, let me just say this very quickly. The, what you're talking Thomas about the here, Presbyter. I'm sorry. We have Thomas the Presbyter, who also refers to a man named Muhammad. What's fascinating, when you look at every one of these references to Muhammad, they place him in Gaza, they place him in Damascus, they place him in Hira, what is today Kufa, which is just south of Baghdad. These are way up in Iraq and Syria, and also in what is uh, in, in uh, Gaza, which is next to Israel, way up in the north, 600 to 1,000 to 1,200 miles further north, nowhere near Mecca. But look and see who these Muhammads are. One of them is this king, who's a Jewish king, lives in Hira. He comes over to Jerusalem, and in 638, takes over and uh, conquers Jerusalem. Sophronius is there as the bishop and invites him to come to, to pray in the Church of the Sepulcher, which he refuses to do, because he's a Jew, not a Muslim, he's a Jew. His name is Umar. But that's not the Umar of the, of the, the caliphate, of the four rightly guided caliphs, because the Umar of Islam lives way down in, way down in Medina, was not a Jew. And he doesn't come and destroy Jerusalem in 638. What's fascinating, so the Muhammad that we do see and the references that are coming out of Thomas the Presbyter and uh, the, uh, the, the Bishop Sibaeus and also of the Doctrine Iacomi, every one of these Muhammads is a reference to a person who is the praised one. We then get to Abd al-Malik, and Abd al-Malik is the one that really introduces Muhammad. Abd al-Malik is the caliph in Damascus. Notice this is Damascus, not down in Mecca Medina, way up in Syria. He's the caliph of the Marwanid family in the Umayyad Caliphate. He comes to power in 685. And in 691, the first thing he does, he goes to Jerusalem, of all places, and builds that large structure, the Dome of the Rock. I don't know if you've been there or if you've seen it. You, can, you can't help but see it on any picture yeah, today because it's so beautiful. Yeah. That Dome of the Rock was built in 691. And he writes inscriptions around it. And take a look at the inscriptions he writes. They're all attacking Jesus Christ. Say not three, for God is one, and he has no son. That is later than put into chapter 4, verse 171 of the Quran, it's what it is, where there is today. For God does not begetteth, nor is he begotten, chapter 112 in the Quran today. So this is attacking Jesus' divinity, it's attacking the Trinity, and it's attacking the sonship of Jesus Christ. This is all attacks against Jesus. All these inscriptions are attacking Jesus. Then it says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, there is only one God but God, and the praised one is nothing more than the messenger. So who's the praised one now? Well, what are all the inscriptions referring to? They're all referring to Jesus. The praised one in this case is Jesus. It's all talking about Jesus. Yet that's the first time we see the Shahada, which is the statement of faith for all Muslims in the world today. It's first introduced in 691 by Abd al-Malik on the Dome of the Rock. It's also induced, uh, introduced the very same year on the coins. And he has it right there on the coins, which is fascinating because when you look at the coins of Abd al-Malik, he, is, he introduces this, confronting Jesus, confronting the Trinity, confronting his sonship. Justinian II, who's the Byzantine emperor at that time, gets angered by what he is doing, and he attacks Abd al-Malik. Abd al-Malik wins the battle, then introduces a brand new coin in 693 with his image on it. I didn't know Muslims could have image. And there he is, he's standing there with a sword, showing that he's victorious, and there is the Shahada around the outside in Arabic. Then in 696, he introduces a brand new coin. I have this coin. I bought it. It cost me $1,300 to buy it. It's a gold solidus, and it's got the image taken off, and it has all these inscriptions that are in the Dome of the Rock around the side against the divinity of Jesus, against the Trinity, and against his sonship. And then right smack dab in the middle is, for there is only one God. And the prophet or the messenger, I mean, the, the praised one, is nothing more than the messenger of God. 
This is an anti-Trinitarian attack against the Trinity. This is a Christian. He is a Christian. He's an anti-Trinitarian Christian who's attacking the Trinitarian uh, uh, theology of the Byzantines. It's not only a political attack, it's a theological attack. That's why they built the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. Why didn't they build the Dome of the Rock in Mecca? There was no Mecca at that time. Why didn't they build it in Damascus where he lived? There was, the reason why he built it in Jerusalem is he built it on the rock, the Mount, Mount Moriah. This is where the Messiah is going to return again. If you're a Christian and you know the Messiah is going to return again, you put it right where the Messiah is going to return. And what do you do? You put it looking down on the Church of the Sepulcher, which is the... The, the pilgrimage headquarter for all the Christians, you put it where the Jews believe the Messiah is going to come, and you stick there, you stick it against the Byzantine Christianity, which is right down, which is all around you. They're, they are your greatest threat as a rising Arab power. But remember, you're not a Muslim yet. There's no reference to Muslim yet, not in 691. We can't find it anywhere, or to the religion called Islam. That only gets introduced in the 8th century. And it gets introduced on the coins and the inscriptions. Ilka Ista Lindstad, who's probably done the best work on the inscriptions, he's looked at over 100 of these inscriptions, these rock inscriptions, from 640 up to 740. And he notices that there is a trajectory. You can see an evolution in this theology. And it starts in 690 with Abdul Malik, with his inscriptions. But there's still no, that's where the, the name Muhammad is, or the, inter, the reference to Muhammad, the praise one, is introduced. First time it's introduced there. But then as you get into around 6, 720, 730, then you start seeing these people of faith, the Muslims, those who obey, those who submit, the Muslims. That's what Muslim means. Or Islam, starting with the Aleph, the fourth declension. And there, there are the people of the religion of the submission, the religion of obedience. It's not peace. This is obedience and submission. That's where then they start becoming a distinctive group in contradistinction to the Byzantine Christianity. It's not till 730 on the inscriptions that actually Muhammad then takes the place of a man, a prophet himself. So the Abbasids come while the Umayyads are now getting weaker. The Abbasids come in 749. They take over. They then take the capital from Damascus and bring it down to what is today Baghdad. It used to call Stesiphon. And they are the ones that create Muhammad the man. And they, 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 of course, once you create Muhammad the man, he, ha he is a prophet. He has to have a book. So where are you going to get a book from? Well, Remember, the Arabs don't have any identity like the Jews and the Christians have. The Jews and the Christians who are their cousins, they have a scripture, and they also have a prophetic line. You're Arab, you're Ishmaelite, you don't have a, a prophetic line because it's stopped with Ishmael. So what do you need to do? You need to create a prophet who has a book. So how are you going to get a book? Take a look at the Quran, and this is what we're now doing. We're not going to get into this because this will just really enlarge. But look and see when the manuscripts start to appear. There are no Quranic manuscripts in the 7th century. We can't find one. Look at the Topkapi, the Samarkand, the Ma'il, the Petropolitanus, the Husseini, and the Sana manuscript. Those are the six major manuscripts. They're all in existence today. We now have them. I have three of them, facsimiles, in my house, in my, uh, in my, uh, my studio. Take a look at those six manuscripts, and you will see they are all 8th and 9th century manuscripts. They don't have any dots on them. They don't have any vowels. They're just consonantal texts. They're called what they call razm, which means you can put dots and vowels wherever you want to. There's just 14 letters in Arabic at this time. But today, there's 28 letters. So obviously, need, they need to start putting in these dots Final and vowels. Final question for you. Why do you think that Western scholarship hasn't, hasn't focused on... Islam and its its documents, its founding, the way they've tried to, you know, the same kind of severe tests to which they subjected the Bible. And the Bible always survives those tests. I mean, we know that the Gospels date to the first century. We, we know this. Uh, archaeological evidence increasingly supports the scriptural testimony of who Jesus was. I mean, we have, as one Princeton scholar put it, an embarrassing uh, uh, um, amount of riches as it relates to the text of Scripture and evidence to support it. Why ha hasn't Western scholarship subjected Islam to the same kind of scrutiny? I think because we don't have a Wellhausen yet. We don't have a school of Tübingen that had, they existed in Germany in the 1800s that did that to the Bible. The, the higher criticism. Higher criticism really yes. was in, in, it was not created on the Bible, but it was enlarged and certainly it's matured kind of like on the Bible. Yeah. And that's why we're talking about over 100 years ago, this was done to the Bible. You know, but and I think this is, I mean, I think of something like this. This to me is, is very funny. Just saying this is, 
you know, somebody who taught Western civilization for so long. You know, we have, you feel free to use this, we have no firsthand evidence of Alexander the Great. Did you know that? Right. We have no secondhand, a, a reliable, undisputed secondhand account Don't we have three of biographies Alexander of the Great. Though? Pardon me? Don't we have three biographies written by who are the ones who wrote the, the biographies? The, the best ones we have are third hand and they're courteous and Arius. They're, they're Roman. Uh, they, they come much later. And they are, we, we have no idea what they're based on. So we're talking about uh, the evidence and no surviving undisputed images of who he is. So we're talking about stuff that was written centuries after Alexander the Great. And yet, no credible scholar that argues that Alexander the Great didn't live. And yet, we have no firsthand, no secondhand, only thirdhand accounts of Alexander the Great. Can I respond to this? We have firsthand accounts of who Jesus was, right. multiple. Right. And yet, you have people who will say, probably write in the comments, Jesus, did, <laughs> Jesus didn't exist. Go ahead. All right, let's now apply this to Islam. Where is the firsthand <laughs> evidence of Muhammad? I mean, sit, what they call the Siddha, the biography of Muhammad. You would think it would be written by eyewitnesses, like Matthew and John would have been eyewitnesses to what they wrote. Luke and Mark got it from those who were the eyewitnesses, right? Yeah. At least they were living in the same area and they were living in the same century, right? There is not one reference at all to anybody living in the, first, uh, the, the seventh century of Muhammad at all. There's no biography. So the biography that we use today is written by a guy named Ibn Isak. That's what's written on the title. Ibn Isak. Who's Ibn Isak? He died in 765. Muhammad supposedly died in 632. How many years? That's 130 years later. But we have nothing by Ibn Isak. Not a word by Ibn Isak. So where, what is it the biography we use? We use a biography written by Ibn Hisham, who died in 833. Muhammad died in 632. Do your math. That's 200 years. Not for 200 years do we have the first biography of Muhammad written down. Now, I'm going to go one step further. Where is Ibn Hisham's manuscript? Yet everybody reads it. I had to read it. You read it. If you go to any school and you will see the biography of Muhammad, the prophet Muhammad, written by Ibn Isak, translated by whatever the translation is. Where do you think it comes from? It comes from a German scholar named Mustadfell who wrote it between 1858 and 1860. That's 160 years ago. The biography of Muhammad was first com compiled and put together by a German scholar in Germany in the eight, late 1800s, going to four different German cities, going to all the libraries and going to their different uh, universities. He went into the libraries and just grabbed different pieces, scraps of bits and pieces of Arabic. He was an Arabist himself and put it together. And that is the biography that is now attributed to Ibn Hisham, who's attributed to Ibn Ishaq, written in the 1860s. We have nothing earlier than the 1860s. Isn't that incredible? Yet, how many, people, how many Muslims have heard this before? And see, the, only the Germans were the ones that told me about this, the Inada group. They were the ones that have this material. I didn't know about it until, be, uh, until last September. And yet nobody is ballyhooing or no one's asking about that. Look at the traditions concerning what Muhammad said. The only one is the Hadith. And those are much more prolific. Nine volumes of, of al-Buhari alone. And that's how Muslims know how to walk, talk, eat, drink, sleep. Where do you think that comes from? Al-Buhari, I just get his name. When did he die? 870. Do we have one manuscript from 870 from the 9th century, which is 240 years after Muhammad? Do we have one ma manuscript? Absolutely not. The first manuscript we have of Al-Buhari does not appear to the 11th century. The other eight volumes don't appear to the 16th century. Can you see how we can destroy Muhammad right now just by applying what I've just said here? Don't worry about Alexander the Great. Islam has a much more dire problem. And yet nobody is saying so, we're saying so, and saying, for heaven's sakes, just ask simple questions that were asked about Jesus Christ in our Bible. For heaven's sakes, ask the same question about Muhammad and the Quran. Look at the Quran. The fact that we can't find one complete Quran until the 10th century, and this book that I have in my hand today was only chosen as the final Quran out of 30 different Qurans, 30 completely different Qurans, this was chosen in 1924 by one man named Muhammad al husseini Al-Hudad in, in Cairo at Al-Azhar University, 1924. And they had to take the other 29 Qurans, all Arabic Qurans, and dump them in the Nile, thinking that they could get rid of them. We have now re found all 29. We now have all 30 Qurans. I have nine of them in my library. Hutton has all 30 of them. We then went down to Speaker's Corner and held them up in 2016 so the whole world could see it. And that shut down the Quran. That went viral all over the world. Two, uh, three years ago in 2020 on June 8th, 
Muhammad Hijab, who is right there, he's uh, right there in the crowd watching us as we were holding up these 26 different Qurans. At that time, she only had 26. We held him up for the world to see. He was filming it, saw what was happening, stepped outside, called the whole crowd to come to him and said, do not look at what they're showing you. Do not listen to what they're saying. I'll explain it to you. This is Muhammad Hijab. He has a following of 500,000 on the internet right now. So is, is, is he the Islamic version of Mark Zuckerberg? No, no. This is a, he, he is a... He uh, did suggest. He's a, he's he's a, a YouTube. Censorship. He's a YouTube. Never mind. He's a YouTube bigwig. He is all over the YouTube. So he, he lives in London. I've debated him a number of times. He's six foot seven. He's a tall, tall guy. So he was saying that he was going to explain it. He could not explain it because four years later, on June 8, 2020, he had to go to Dr. Yasser Qadi. Dr. Yasser Qadi is the world authority on the Quran, on the Kirat. These are known as Kirats and the Ahruf. He got his doctorate at Yale University in 1995, and he had a 28 interview on Zoom with him. So Muhammad Hijab is there in uh, London, and Yasser Qadi is in Houston because he, he's, uh, he lives here in Houston, in Texas. And he asked him a very simple question. He said, listen... I'm going to put a blank sheet of paper, and I want you to tell me which Quran is the one that's eternal, which is the one that was revealed to Muhammad, which is the Quran that was written by Uthman in 652. Is it the Hafs? Is it this one? Is it the Warsh? Is it the Kailul? Is it the Kikisai? He started naming a number of them. Before he could finish, good old Yasser Qadi said, do not ask me this question. We do not talk about this in public. Turn off the camera. Ask me afterwards. This has been the most difficult question for the last thousand years for Muslim scholars. He says, the West, here in the West, they have come leaps and bounds. And when I went to Yale University in 1995, I got my doctorate there. He said, I went through a crisis of knowledge. Not a crisis of faith, but a crisis of knowledge, because I'd never come across this before in all my studies. These Multiple, multiplicity of Ara These are not translations. These are Arabic Qurans, all over a thousand years old. No two are alike. There's 93,000 differences between them. Different words. Different, different words means different meanings. Mean, di means different theologies, different doctrines, different practices. He says, do not talk about this. We do not talk about this. And Muhammad Hijab said, well, this must be an easy question. Just give me which one it is. Which, which one is it? He says, I have not talked about this for 25 years. I have, you notice, I've not said anything on all my YouTube channel. He has a following of about a half a million as well, Yasser Qadi. He says, I've never talked about this. Now, he didn't know that we were watching this live. We were watching this. I was watching it because I've been told that this interview was going to happen. And I was recording it on my computer to make sure that we held on to it. And I start saying, thank God, here's a guy who's finally being honest. He said... The West has gone leaps and bounds over the last hundred years, and they're looking at us Muslims, you especially, as an emperor with no clothes. He says, you, referring you in the East, and he's written, of course, he's there in London. He says, you in the East, your standard narrative has holes in it. Standard narrative has holes in it. That's, the, that's where we now get the standard Islamic narrative. That's why we're using it all over the world now. Standard Islamic narrative, S-I-N. Sin has holes in it. It's brilliant. He just walked right into that trap. He said, your standard narrative has holes in it because you don't know how to answer this question. So he says, okay, I'm going to put up. He a second time, this is about 28 minutes later, he puts his hand out a second time and says, help me here. Which Quran is the one that's eternal? Which one is it? Yasakati had to give an answer. He said, well, they're all the Quran. A little bit of Warsh, a little bit of Hut, to, hut uh, Hafs a little bit of Kasai, a little bit of Ibn Kathir. Just put them all in and just mix them out, and that's the Quran we have today. And I started clapping. Now, within two weeks, within two weeks, they had this interview on both their channels. Within two weeks, they had to completely shut down the comments. Because I was reading the comments. There were hundreds and hundreds of comments of Muslims saying, I have left Islam because of this. Because you are the ones that have told us that the Quran has never changed. Not one word, not one letter. It is the exact same Quran that we have today that Muhammad received that has always existed in heaven. If there's one letter, one change, that means man has changed it. How can man change what God has, 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 uh, God has instituted? More than that, the Quran makes that claim. The Quran says so in chapter 85, verse 21 and 22, that this is the eternal Quran. In chapter 10, verse 15, in chapter 18, verse 27, no word can change. Man cannot change the Quran. In chapter 15, verse 9, it says why? Because Allah himself preserves it, protects it, guards it. If God guards it, how can man change it? That's what the Quran makes that claim. That's why Yusuf Qadi has to make these claims. And here, in just 28 minutes, he had destroyed the Quran. 
Within two months, they had to take that interview off, to, off both their channels. But I have it. Hatun has it. David Wood has it. And every June 20th, so I just did it a few weeks ago, on June 20th, sorry, June 8th, every June 8th, we introduce that interview again. And we have a celebration of how the Quran's preservation was all destroyed. And it all happened because of one woman, five foot two, found these 26 different Qurans by just traveling around. You can get them in Morocco. You can get them also in Syria. You can get them in Yemen. You can get them on the internet here in the United States. You can order nine of them right now. And the two best to order are the Hafs and Warsh. Just look at the Hafs and Warsh, the two most popular Qurans used today to memorize the Quran. And there's 5,000 differences between them. So how could they say there's one Quran? And how could they say this is from God? We shut down the Quran in 2016. One, want to be clear that what we're saying here is uh, this isn't Islamophobia. Uh, this isn't, you know, this isn't hate being dumped out on uh, on Muslims. Uh, or rather, this is just simply stating historical fact and historical truth of which no one should really be afraid of. I mean, if your religion is true, if it's, I, you know, the Apostle Paul said, if you can disprove, he essentially said this, if you can disprove the resurrection, then our faith is nothing. Yeah. And there's never been, you know, there's never been anyone who's been able to do that. Um, our resources are abundant as it stands uh, regarding the, the resurrection and the historicity of the Christian faith. We have an abundance of resources, incredible resources uh, that support our faith. And yet, if you can demolish that, it's interesting. Some years ago, I was in, in debate with a very prominent um, atheist who kept going after water into wine, water into wine, water into wine. I mean, who could believe this? And I said, look, I mean, you keep, you keep whining about water into wine. If you really want to go for the jugular of the Christian faith, disprove the resurrection. Yeah. And the whole thing you know, will collapse. And that, that is the pillar upon which it rests. And you're speaking of these three legs of Islam, which you're systematically, you know, kicking out. Let me we, just finish yes. real quickly, this, and just to bring it to a conclusion. What we're now finding about the book, The Man and the Place, since we started out with those three, the book, the Quran, the man, Muhammad, and the place, Mecca, shutting down all three of them using only material and evidence from the seventh century. And we're eradicating it. Uh, there is no book, there is no man, there is no place in the seventh century, maybe the eighth, ninth, and yes, and 10th. If what we're saying really is, the same thing that could be said of Christianity, and yet is it? It would be as if we were saying there was no person named Jesus Christ, there is no book called the Bible at all, and there was no city called Jerusalem at all until the third century. How would we be able to defend ourselves? How would we be able to even preach in the morning on a Sunday morning if we knew that there was no Jesus, there was no Bible or Jerusalem? Until well, the third just century? imagine, just imagine the text that you're discussing, the evidence that you're discussing. How quickly would Discovery Channel have a whole series on how the Christian faith has been disproved? I mean, our, our media would be flooded with every time somebody finds, you know, or encounters, you know, one of these, you know, false gospels, which are so obviously false gospels. They are prepared to drag out, I mean, it's a trope. They drag out the same arguments again and again. It makes headlines. There are people who tend to believe it. The, the kind of wind that the media put in the sails of Dan Brown with the Da Vinci Code, which right. is complete nonsense. But he begins that book by saying, this is based on fact. Yeah. You know, this is, this is based on historical fact. It is, it is a fabricated fiction that is, you know, uh, DC comic-like fiction. Yet it was treated by media as though this was something you could really, really uh, trust and it was, was verifiable. And of course, it simply was not. Jay, it's been a pleasure to have you on this mm -hmm. podcast again. Always good to see you. And uh, I just love your work. I love what you're doing. Just keep going. All right. Thank you.